the encouraging her as you have. I am very, very grateful for that, and I know she is as well. I'm so thankful to be here. Got so many connections with this good church. Uh, we had dinner tonight with, with Harry and Natalie, and Harry's been one of my friends for oh, a long, long, long time. He graduated with Jeremy and I in 1992 from Columbia Academy, so we all came from the same place and all grew up together, and, uh, and that, that's meant a lot. Uh, we moved down to uh, Decatur in 1995 for me to go to law school and met John and Jenny at Avondale. And uh, that's when I played on Burnett Insurance softball team. So when I drove past Burnett Insurance up there, I thought, well, I wish I had my softball shirt from way back. Way back then, it probably wouldn't fit me, though. Uh, tonight, I have a really, really difficult subject. And, 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 and I'm sure when it was assigned to me, the person that assigned it, didn't think it was that difficult, and, I, and I, made, I might have made it more difficult than it is. I've been thinking about it for months. I've been working on it for, for literally weeks. Um, and today, when I finally got done with quite possibly the longest PowerPoint presentation I've ever, I've ever made, I told Georgia, I said, wow, I'm finally done with that. I'm so glad. And she said, uh, did you make it too long? And I said, yes, it's, it's absolutely too long. Uh, and, and so I, I hope as we get into this subject tonight, I can, I can demonstrate to you why this was difficult to me, why, why it was such a complex uh, subject to think about the kingdom. I, you know, I, I'll, give you, I'll give you the short answer. The, the short answer, and I think the one that we make from, uh, for the most part when we have this discussion, is that the kingdom is the church. The church is the kingdom. And that's right. It's just not a complete answer. And so tonight, the time that we have together, it's a right answer, like... But it's just not a complete answer. So tonight, in the time that we have, what I want to do is try to develop this idea so that we understand what the Scripture talks about when it means kingdom. Now, sometimes it'll mean one thing, sometimes it'll mean another thing, but ultimately it always means the same thing, and that is God's kingdom. And we'll talk about that as we go. But here's our subject, kingdom come. Our first text is in Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. And, and it says this, Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. This Luke chapter 17 passage, and I've got to apologize about my voice tonight. I, about three days ago I developed this really, really tough head cold that moved and parked right about here. So, so I'm sorry about that. And I may have to stop and cough from time to time. And Harry got me some water up here, so I appreciate that. Uh, but as we look at this passage of Scripture, we're going to understand two things. That, that here are the Pharisees who are coming to Jesus, and they say, when is the kingdom coming? So there was an expectation that the kingdom was going to come. We're going to talk about that expectation. Jesus then says to them something that is, it is a pretty tricky thing, and I think something that's probably been misinterpreted uh, by, most, uh, by most of us have we looked at it at least from time to time. Another passage that I thought about when I looked at this idea of kingdom come is what Jesus said in the uh, Sermon on the Mount when he was teaching uh, those who were there to pray when he, when he gave the model prayer, and he said, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is, as it is in heaven, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There are three things that I want to look at on this slide before we go any further. And that first one is this. Uh, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, I think that's a bad translation. Now, I appreciate the idea that we have kind of adopted that and, and said, you know, the kingdom is, is in our hearts and it's within us. I don't think that's the best translation. As a matter of fact, the ESV translated it this way. The kingdom of God is among you or the kingdom of God is in your midst. Now, I'll tell you why I think that makes more sense. Look, it's the Pharisees who have come to him. The Pharisees come and ask when the kingdom of God is going to come. And Jesus responds to the Pharisees who I think by any way that we look at Jesus' interactions with the Pharisees, the last thing he's going to tell them is that the kingdom of God is in your heart. That's not what he's telling them. What he's telling them is the kingdom of God is among them. The kingdom of God is around them. The kingdom of God is in the midst of them, not that it is an internal kingdom. That's not what he's saying, although this translation would lead us and has led us to believe that we're talking about an internal kingdom here. That's not what he's saying. 
Now another problematic thing as we look at these two passages of scriptures is this phrase, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Have you ever heard anybody suggest to you that we can pray every bit of this prayer right now except for the phrase, your kingdom come? We're not supposed to pray, your kingdom come, because in fact the kingdom has already come. Well, I think, I hope that as we get to the end of our lesson tonight, we'll be able to see that that is still a perfectly appropriate thing for us to pray. We can still pray, your kingdom come. Now what solves this whole dilemma for both of these things is this is what's said at the very bottom of Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 through 13. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. How long is the kingdom? Well, it's forever. Whose is it? It's God's. It's God's kingdom. It's forever. What forever means it is from eternity. It was before time began. It's, before, it's, it's after time ends. The kingdom of God is eternal. F.W. Maddox wrote a book several years ago titled this, The Eternal Kingdom. And that's what the kingdom of God is. So when we talk about whether we're looking at physical Israel or we're looking at the church, what we are seeing are manifestations of the eternal kingdom of God in human history. And that's why, as, as we go through this, I hope we'll be able to see the complexity of, of this issue. Look at the word kingdom in Scripture. This was kind of fascinating for me. The word kingdom occurs 365 times in Scripture. If you read uh, the Bible once a day, uh, you'd come across this word uh, at least one day, one day a year. Uh, it's 365 times in there. That's a lot, a pretty, pretty significant number. In the Old Testament, it occurs 210 times. But keep in mind that when you're in the Old Testament, you're talking about the kingdom of Og, the kingdom of Bashan, the kingdom of, you know, you've got lots of kingdoms in the Old Testament. So the word can apply to lots of different things in the Old Testament. Sometimes it's the kingdom of Israel. Sometimes it's the kingdom of Judah. Sometimes it's the kingdom of Assyria. You know, that, that it applies to lots of different things. But watch the density of this word and its occurrences when we move into the New Testament. In the New Testament, we see this word 155 times. Now, that's not much less than the 210 times in the 39 books of the Old Testament. You've got the 27 books of the New Testament. They're much smaller. And the word occurs 155 times without the other geopolitical uh, kingdoms that we read about in the Old Testament. So almost every kingdom reference in the New Testament is to a spiritual kingdom or God's kingdom. Now watch this. this. This I thought was fascinating. In Matthew, which is often called the kingdom gospel, you have the word kingdom occurring 55 times. 55 times in the 28 chapters of Matthew. Matthew is talking about the kingdom, and most of those references are to the kingdom of God or a term that I think is equivalent to that, and there I'm sure is some debate about this, but I think the phrase kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven mean the same thing. I think it's a synonym. We're talking about exactly the same thing. So you've got this word 55 times in the Gospel of Matthew. You've got it 19 times in the book of Mark, a significantly shorter book. And then in Luke you have it 45 times. What that means is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you have the word, God, the word kingdom occurring 119 of the 155 times it occurs in the New Testament. The Gospels are kingdom rich. They are about the kingdom. Now, John only references the word kingdom three times. Uh, and there are some important references to the kingdom of, of God or the kingdom of heaven in in the Gospel of John. For instance, the uh, discussion with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, uh, where a man cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless he is born of water and the Spirit. In John chapter 18, when uh, Jesus is on trial before Pilate and tells Pilate, uh, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then my, uh, those who were in my kingdom would rise up and they would, they would fight this, they would resist this. So there are very few references in the Gospel of John to kingdom, but they are important references. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, however, are replete with references to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. I want to call this idea that I want to throw out there to you tonight, not just kingdom come, but kingdom come, kingdom came, and kingdom coming. That there is a longing for a coming kingdom, there is the granting of that kingdom, and then there is a further longing 
for something else. Okay, let's, let's draw it up this way. First of all, the Lord's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, is eternal. It was standing before time began, and it will stand after time ends. The Lord's kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is eternal. Okay? That, that is the, the primary fact that I want us to take from this. And what we're going to see throughout human history is, is there has been manifestations of God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the, uh, the God's kingdom on earth, but God's kingdom itself is eternal before time and after time. The Lord has manifested His kingdom to some degree on earth during each of the three ages. Okay, we're going to talk about that as we go. There are three distinct biblical ages, sometimes called dispensations. Maybe you've heard this, maybe you haven't. Maybe, maybe this goes way back and is tickling some things back in your memory. And, if, and hopefully we'll remind you of those, uh, those things. And if you haven't, hopefully we'll give you enough that you can, that you can work with that too. Um, in each of these ages, there was or is the expectation of a coming kingdom, okay? In each of the ages, whether it was the patriarchal age or the mosaic age or the Christian age, there was an expectation of something that was coming, okay? When we talk about us being in the Christian age, I will tell you that there is an expectation that we have that something is coming, right? So in each age, there is an expectation that something is coming. But also, for each of these ages, there was or will be a culmination of the expectation for that age. Okay, that, that you have the expectation, then you have the culmination. That there was an expectation during the patriarchal age, during the age of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, there was an expectation. And finally, there was a culmination that went along with that expectation, right? Okay, let's watch how this develops. Uh, the Lord's kingdom, the, the first thing that we want to prove, the first thing that we want to establish is that the Lord's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, is eternal. It was standing before time began and will be standing after time ends. Daniel chapter 4 verse 3, interestingly, one of the most powerful kings who has ever reigned in the history of the world says this about God. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, says this about God. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. And the most, one of the most powerful kings who ever lived says this about the kingdom of God. It is an everlasting kingdom from generation to generation. Obviously, when we think about the throne of God, we are dealing with a subject that we simply cannot approach in words or in pictures or in anything else. As a matter of fact, the best we can do is to think about the unapproachableness of the kingdom of God. You're going to see this slide, and what I want to show you here on, on this slide right here is I want to, I want to show you this, this blue line right here, and I want to suggest to you that this blue line is the timeline of eternity. That it goes from before time began to after time ends, and it never stops, okay? That's what eternity is. And right in the middle of the line that is eternity is one little dot that represents human history. Before human history, you had the throne room of God. You had the kingdom of God. After human history, you're going to have the kingdom of God again. Still there, never stopping. From generation to generation, from dominion to dominion, it is an everlasting kingdom. So when we talk about the kingdom of God being Israel, then that's one thing, but it's only a sub-point of the eternal kingdom of God. When we talk about the kingdom of God being the church, then that's another thing and, and probably a much more advanced and more complex situation than the physical kingdom of Israel, but still just a sub-point of the eternal kingdom of God. Only as it appears in human history. So the first thing we establish is that God's kingdom is eternal. Look at these great passages of Scripture. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 15. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel... The one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God. <coughs> Excuse me. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. First Chronicles 29, 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom of Lord and you are exalted as head over all. So when we're talking about the kingdom of God, we're talking about the kingdom that belongs to God. We're talking about an eternal kingdom that is above every other kingdom that has ever been 
and was before and will be after. The book of Psalms has a lot to say about this. Psalm 22, 8, 22, 28 says, For the kingdoms is the Lord's, and He rules over the nations. Psalm 45, 6, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. So when did the kingdom begin? When is the kingdom going to end? The kingdom of God is eternal. It's never going to end. Psalm 103, verse 19, The Lord has established His throne in heaven and His kingdom rules over all. So when you look at this idea of of saying, Kingdom come. Lord, Your kingdom come. We're not talking about it coming into existence. We're talking about it breaking onto human history, if that makes any sense. Because it always existed. Lord, Your kingdom come. Not, not, come out, not come out of non-existence into existence, but manifest itself in the world in which we live. Psalm 140, 145 verses 11 through 13 says this, They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men His mighty acts and the glorious majesty of His kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. So the first point that we need to make, and and hopefully the only point really that we need to make, is that God's kingdom is forever. That it was before time begins, and it it exists after time ends. When we say, Lord, your kingdom come, we're not asking for something that did not exist to come into existence. We're asking that the Lord break forth His kingdom onto the stage of human history. We'll see how He did that. The Lord's kingdom is an eternal kingdom. And the Lord has manifested His kingdom to some degree on earth during each of the three ages. There are three distinct Bible ages. Sometimes these ages are called dispensations. Now, you you may remember this film strip. Raise your hand if you remember this film strip. Remember the old Jewel Miller film strips? Man, I was in East Tennessee um, back when I was just a little boy, and Dad Dad had graduated from the Bear Valley School of Preaching. And we moved to Bluntville, Tennessee, which is right on the right next door to Bristol, right on the Virginia Tennessee line and started a church there. I was just, I was about five at the time, and Dad and Mom uh, moved there because there wasn't a church in town and wanted to, wanted to start a congregation. And we went all over with a old-timey projector and a sheet that we hung on the wall and went in people's homes, and I could, at, at some point in my life, I probably could have told you word for word what the Jewel Miller film, film strips uh, were. Uh, one, two, three, four, and five, all, all of them you could talk about, um, and, and I would know what they were talking about. So you remember this, and you remember one of the things about the Jewel Miller film strips was how you walk through the ideas of the three ages or the three dispensations that there was the patriarchal age, of course. And the patriarchal age was the first, and we're going to look at it this way. There's the patriarchal age, and that's also called the age of the fathers. Remember that? Remember the patriarchal age? And in the patriarchal age, God spoke directly to the heads of the households, whether it was Abraham or whether it was Isaac or whether it was Jacob. During the patriarchal age, uh, God spoke directly to those heads of the houses. Uh, This was characterized by human interaction with God the Father. And then, of course, this, this uh, particular age went from creation to Sinai. Okay, that was the time period. That Sinai really marks the watermark where you move from the patriarchal age into the next age, which is called the Mosaic Age. Okay? And Sinai starts the Mosaic Age when the law of Moses, particularly the Ten Commandments, were handed down to Moses to give to the people of God. This was also called the Age of the Law. God spoke through the law and the prophets, And this particular period is an interesting period because it spans most of the Old Testament from really uh, Exodus chapter 19 where Sinai is all the way up to um, really Jesus' life, death, burial, resurrection and ultimately the preaching of the gospel in Acts chapter 2. Okay, So that's a considerable amount of time covered in this Mosaic age. It's characterized by human interaction with God the Son. And it spans Sinai to Pentecost. So Exodus chapter 19 to Acts chapter 2. That's that, that's that second age, the Mosaic age. The third is this age, just the Christian age. 
It's also called the age of the church. God spoke through the inspired apostles, uh, who of course gave us the New Testament. This is characterized by human interaction with God the Spirit. And that's, this is an interesting kind of way of looking at this, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Um, and, and just kind of an interesting way of thinking about how God dealt with humanity in each of these three ages. And of course this goes from Pentecost to a date that hasn't happened yet, and that is the day of the Lord's return. We're living in the Christian age now. We're living in the age of the church now. <coughs> so sorry about that. Okay, so in each of these, in each of these periods, the patriarchal period, the mosaic period, and the Christian age or the Christian dispensation, in each of these periods, there is an expectation of a coming kingdom and there is a culmination, okay? We'll see this as we go. We'll look at each of these ages and tell you that there is in each age an expectation and then there's a culmination, okay? Now, because this particular age hasn't ended yet, we're not going to see the culmination of the expectation that we have until the Lord does return, okay? But we're going to think about it, and we ought to be thinking about it all the time. And we ought to be saying like John did, even so, come Lord Jesus. And we ought to be praying like Jesus instructed, thy kingdom come, okay? Because that's what we're looking forward to. All right. Now, one of the reasons why this is, is a tricky subject is because of some misunderstandings and, and bad teachings about what it means when human history ends and the Lord's kingdom, which has always existed and will always continue to exist, what that means. Because what some people have said that means is, well, Jesus is going to come back. He's going to establish a kingdom here on earth. That's, that's not what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about not only the expectation that we have of the Lord's return and being part of His eternal kingdom, our desires that culminate in the Lord's return, but finally we are seeing at the day of the Lord's return the perfection that we haven't seen yet, that we haven't been given a window to yet. Okay, But we will see when the Lord returns and this earth and everything in it is burned up. All right, so let's think about this. Um, in each age, there was a kingdom expectation and a kingdom culmination. Okay, so think about that. Get that in your head. That in, you got three ages, and in each of those ages, you have two things. You have a kingdom expectation, and then that expectation culminates with something. Okay? I, I drew up this little diagram, and I hope it's helpful to you. Again, the blue line is eternity, okay? And it goes from way, 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 way. We can't even start where it starts, and we can't even end where it ends, Okay? But we can think about it, and our mind can boggle at it, and we can be overwhelmed by it. But right there in the middle of eternity, you have creation, okay? From creation to Sinai, you have the patriarchal age. From Sinai to Pentecost, you have the Mosaic age. And from Pentecost to the Day of Judgment, you have the Christian age, okay? In each of those periods, what we have is a, an expectation and a culmination. An expectation and a culmination. An expectation and a culmination. Each of those are involved in each of these periods. Okay? There's a kingdom expectation, and that culminates in something. Let's, let's see how this works. There was an expectation in the patriarchal age that a kingdom was coming. Look at what Genesis 17, 1 through 7 says. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall... Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. So right in the middle of Genesis, really all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, which is just the, almost the very start of Genesis, you have God coming to Abraham and saying, you are going to be the father of kings. It's going to be a great nation come from you. Well, Abram goes on and on and on and on. He has no kids. And God keeps telling him, there is a stars on the sky, as a sand on the seashore. So there's this building expectation of this kingdom that's coming. It's not coming very fast, obviously, because when you read the story about Abraham, 
and then his son Isaac, and then you read about his sons, uh, Jacob and Esau, and you, and you read all the things that they're going through. What, when's this kingdom going to come? And then when you read the 70 folks go down to, to Egypt and, and they are, are there because of the famine that's in the land, and then the next thing you know, we open to the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus. And this nation has grown into a great nation, but, but are they a kingdom? Well, they're slaves. They're slaves to the Egyptians. So there's this great yearning expectation in the patriarchal age that one day God is going to make us a kingdom. We don't know when he's going to get around to it, and he's sure taking his sweet time to do it, but we expect that to occur. And in fact, it did occur in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. This is at Sinai. Moses is, God is speaking here, and he speaks to Moses, and here's what he tells the Israelites. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 400 years of slavery. They've come out of slavery. And now he says, I'm going to fulfill my promise that I made to Abraham. That expectation that you have that you're going to be a great nation, you're about to see it happen. Okay. So at the point of Sinai, of, of Exodus chapter 19, God fulfills that purpose. He makes a great nation of the Israelites. And of course, you see how this story develops as well. Uh, I'm going to skip a couple of these, although this is a great passage of Scripture. Going all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 17, the Lord says, listen, one of these days there's going to be kings, and this is the way those kings need to act. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. Interestingly, that's exactly what they said, isn't it? Hundreds of years before that actually happened. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your brethren you shall set as a king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book, and the one before the priest, the Levites, and it shall be with him. He shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandments to the right hand or the left, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Hundreds of years before there was a king, there was this kingdom expectation that finally culminated in Exodus 19 when God said, you are that nation. And we know there was still a lot of history. There was still the 40 years of wandering. There was still the uh, conquest of, of the promised land. There was still the period of judges. But by Exodus chapter 19, we have entered into that first culmination of the expectation. Okay. Now watch this. This was a kingdom in every sense of the word. It had kings and throne rooms and, and it had crowns and scepters and swords and all of those things that went with, had gold and temples and palaces and all of those things that went with what people today think of when they think of a kingdom. In each age there was those two things, okay? And we see that right there in that first age. They expected it and it happened, okay? But then look what happened after that. Then because of their disobedience, then because of their unfaithfulness, the kingdom was destroyed. Israel and Judah split. Both were carried away. Both were utterly uh, and profoundly not only destroyed, but humiliated in the process. The Jews are carried into Babylonian exile for 70 years. The temple is destroyed. The palaces are destroyed. Everything is wiped out. Okay? At that point, you have a growing expectation during the Mosaic Age that the kingdom's going to come back. Think about that. During the Patriarchal Age, we're looking forward to the coming of the kingdom. Well, the kingdom came. Well, in the Mosaic Age, the kingdom is destroyed, and yet there's an expectation that the Lord's going to do something about that. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 43, it says, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member. Now, see, we've moved into the Gospels now. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Look at this, what it tells us about Joseph of Arimathea. He was waiting for the kingdom of God. He was a Pharisee. He was on the Sanhedrin. He's waiting for the kingdom of God. 
In Acts chapter 1 verse 6, we're already, to the, we're already through the Gospels into the book of Acts and look at what the disciples asked Jesus. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? So you have for hundreds of years after the destruction of Jerusalem, this expectation during the Mosaic age that the Lord is going to reestablish His kingdom. Okay? There's that expectation. And it's going to culminate in Acts chapter 2. Okay? And notice once again the heavy emphasis on kingdom in the Gospels that's finally going to be, uh, finally going to come about in Acts chapter 2. Okay, watch this. Now, why, why was there this great expectation in the Mosaic Age? Well, first of all, they, it was motivated by the destruction of Jerusalem and the Babylonian exile. They saw Jerusalem get destroyed. They saw it go from being the most powerful nation in the world under Solomon to being rubble, okay? And they wanted to fix that. They wanted back the glory days, okay? It was also fueled by the message of the major and minor prophets. Daniel, Isaiah, all of these prophets were talking about the Lord's kingdom and the Lord rebuilding His kingdom and reestablishing His kingdom. It was stoked by the preaching of John the Baptist and Jesus. Remember what their message was? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, that's, what they're, that's what they're preaching about. It was encouraged by Roman domination. By the time we get to the period of the Gospels, the, the Jews are literally under the thumb of the Roman Empire and they're sick of it. They don't want to be that anymore. Uh, and so there's this great desire or expectation that the Lord is going to do something for them. And then lastly, this kingdom expectation centered on the mysterious person of the Messiah. They're looking forward to this Messiah. They're not exactly sure who He is or what He is, but they know He's coming. They have this expectation that He is coming. So this is where that, that expectation came from. I, I, we won't read all of these, but man, they're wonderful. And if you're taking notes, write down at least the re references because these, these are such wonderful predictions of the coming kingdom. Daniel chapter 2, And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, and it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. To uh, him who was like the Son of Man uh, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Isaiah chapter 9 and verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born. Is that familiar with, with, to you? Unto us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. How's the child going to be called Everlasting Father? Think about that. Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So you have these very, very specific references to a coming kingdom. This growing expectation that the Jews had that the Lord was going to break forth once again on human history with his kingdom. Matthew chapter 3, 1 through 6, uh, John the Baptist is preaching, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Quoting Isaiah in Matthew chapter uh, 4, Jesus is preaching. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So now we're talking about another kingdom. Except the Jews hadn't figured out that it's not that kingdom. It's another kingdom. Okay? And we know, of course, that it, that it was. That from Sinai to Pentecost, we're waiting for a new kingdom. And finally, we get it. In Acts chapter 1, 1 through 3, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God which we're going to see manifest itself in the very next chapter of that book. Again, watch Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. We have at the end of the Mosaic Age and the beginning of the Christian Age the culmination of that expectation. And it happened on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Once again, the kingdom of God manifesting itself in human history in the form, this time, not of Israel, but of the church. 
Now, incidentally, when we looked at Exodus chapter 19, that's the very words Peter's going to use in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 to describe the identity of the church. We'll see that in just a second. All right, uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 12. Look at the preaching in, in Acts. When they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God. Acts 19, verse 8. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So look, we're in the kingdom. The church is the kingdom, right? But guess what? It's the same kingdom. It's the kingdom of God from eternity that has now broken forth onto the stage of human history in the form of the church. Watch this. 1 Peter chapter 2, 9. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's almost the exact word-for-word -word description of the identity of the Israelites in Exodus chapter 19. A holy priesthood, a nation of kings. And this, this is the identity that has now been placed upon us as members of God's kingdom now, the church. Revelation 1, 5, and 7 says, He has made us kings and priests. So we're in it. Okay? You are in the kingdom of God. The Lord's kingdom is eternal. The Lord's manifested His kingdom. Let's, let's go on. I'm going to get a couple more things here before we go. Um, but watch this. We still have an expectation of something to come, right? There's still, even in this age, even though we are part of the kingdom of God, which is the church, we are still anticipating and expecting something else, right? And the scriptures speak of this too. 2 Peter 1, 10 and 11. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I thought we'd already been transferred into the kingdom. Why then would we need entrance into the kingdom? You see what we're talking about? We're talking about an expectation that we have that one day the perfect kingdom of God, we're going to get to be a part of that. Okay? Well, the church is the manifestation of that kingdom in, in the world today. But we're still looking forward to something, aren't we? I love what, the Roman, what Paul says in Romans when he says, all of creation groaning, yearning for that culmination. Hebrews 12, 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. How can we be receiving something that we've already got? 2 Timothy 4, 1. I charge you, therefore, before God and Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Okay, so, so it is okay for us to still have an expectation of a kingdom coming. Still okay for us to say, Thy kingdom come. Okay? Because we're still waiting for that. Now, we're not talking about an earthly kingdom. We're talking about finally, with time wiped off the board, being part of that kingdom of God that never ceased to exist. And us recognizing our grace-given place in the eternal kingdom of God. Um, 1 Corinthians 6.10, all, all these passages say, hey, listen, you can't get in the kingdom of God if you have these types of sin in your life. And he goes, 1 Corinthians 16, Galatians 5.21, Ephesians 5.5. Uh, 5. Uh, let, me, let me make this as quick as possible. And, and here's another, this is one of the ones that, that really weighed on me as I was thinking about this and establishing this in my mind at least. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Now think about that. Is the kingdom of God the church? Yes. Well, are we flesh and blood? Yes. Well, flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. So obviously we're not talking about one and the same thing, right? Okay, we're talking about something different. We're talking about something that's going to happen in, in the future. Each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits after those who are Christ that is coming. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom of God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. And what we finally come to is what we started with. And that is the eternal kingdom of God. Now let me read you one passage of scripture and then these thoughts will be yours for tonight. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. 
And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people. God Himself will be with them and be their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then He who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And He said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God. And he shall be my son. Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be able to be part of your kingdom. We're so thankful that one day in the throne room of heaven we will fall down at your holy and mighty feet and cast the crowns that you have given us at those feet, Father, because nothing will matter more than your rightful place. And Father, we pray that we will always seek to give you that rightful place now. Father, we are so thankful to read about your kingdom in the pages of Scripture. We're thankful to read about David. We're thankful to read about the day of Pentecost. And Father, we are thankful to be able to look forward to that day when finally human history ceases, when time stops, and your eternal kingdom goes on forever. Give us a place in that kingdom, O Lord. Even so, come Lord Jesus. In His name we pray. Amen.